Hi everyone. Today we're talking about mobile first user acquisition and engagement. My name is Anthony Blattner and I'm a founding partner and mobile lead at Jackrabbit Mobile. We're a mobile design and development firm based in Austin, Texas. So these are a few of my favorite topics to speak on because so much of mobile revolves around optimizing them. We've been doing app development for years and I'm always excited to share some of the things we've learned along the way. So real quick about me, I started as a developer and have been building apps since the App Store first opened. I originally moved to Austin to work for IBM years ago doing e-commerce consulting and working with some big clients. And then it was at South by Southwest, a huge tech and media festival in Austin, Texas that really showed me how explosive mobile was becoming. I remember walking around, talking to a bunch of people and realizing that everyone wanted to hire me. <laughs> well, anyways, a short time later, I founded Jackrabbit Mobile with a few colleagues in Austin, and now we office out of Capital Factory, an awesome tech and incubator co-working space in downtown, and we get to work, work with a wide variety of clients from startups to large tech companies. We're also very involved in the community, and we run the Austin iOS meetup along with mentoring at hackathons and UT's three-day startup. So to set the stage for talking about user acquisition and user engagement on mobile, I'm going to start by explaining first what mobile first means. It's become a buzzword in the industry and I'll show you how we apply it. Then we'll jump into getting users, acquisition, and then engaging those users, engagement. This is going to be a pretty tactical presentation. I'll show a few case studies of apps that are doing this really well and how you can implement these into your own apps. So mobile first is pretty self-explanatory. And I really like how this graphic shows the sequence. Over time, we started with web browsers and large monitors, so we designed for that. Then as tablets and smartphones grew, we took our existing desktop interfaces and we whittled down the content and shrunk them. That puts you in the mindset of what can I cut out and what can I remove. The problem is you want your users to have the same experience on mobile and desktop. But here, by definition, you're breaking down and degrading the original experience you intended for your users. The flip side, being mobile first, is starting by designing your content for smaller interfaces. Start by only considering mobile. And every user story and feature must be perfectly usable and intuitive on the mobile device before you can start planning to scale it up to desktop. If you design with mobile being the target, then you can add and rearrange as your interfaces change and grow without losing the original experience. Now there's two aspects of mobile first that I'll dive into here, content and context. So content. Focus on the actual material you are presenting to the user, the actual media and the functions that, that they're gonna perform. I really like Twitter's example here. Obviously, Twitter's a primarily mobile platform. Most of their traffic comes from mobile. Here's an iOS screenshot showing all the content, media, and functionality. And then you can almost literally see that replicated onto the web with a tweet feed all the way to the compose button, search, and tab bar options. That's mobile first. All of the functions are available through the mobile app. There's nothing that you have to go to the desktop or web version for. And in fact, most of these functions are even easier on mobile. Second is context. With mobile, you have extra contextual data on when and how a user is using your application. And in different situations, users may look to perform different actions. Before I get to Foursquare here, another example is accounting software. I bet no one ever wants to sit on their mobile phone to do accounting for, their, for the year. That I'd rather sit down at a desktop with everything in front of me. But what I do want to do is be able to monitor my transactions on the go. So now looking here to Foursquare and Swarm, a social check-in and review platform where users can check in when they're at a venue and they can leave tips for others. Their use cases and context were so different that they unbundled the platform into two apps. Now Foursquare is about recommendations and reviews. So you can see how both the app and website are centered on discovery, preferences, and suggestions. While Swarm on the right is about checking the venues. You can see the main elements are the activity list and the always accessible check-in button on the top toolbar. But now if you look at Swarm on desktop, it's just a landing page because unless you found a desktop in your favorite restaurant or bar, you're very unlikely to be checking in. Think of the information that your user needs and when they need it. And then think of how they'll use these different interfaces. So now taking a mobile first approach to user acquisition, we'll ask the question, how does your platform spread? On desktop, we can grab URLs and send them back and forth to people. We can send emails, instant messages, but on mobile, we rarely do this, especially on the App Store. I don't think I've ever actually used this menu. I'll just tell someone, hey, go download the Tribeza app. That's okay, but really it's an obstacle. The App Store allows you to share 
but this is before you've even ever downloaded and used the app. So you're not very likely to share it with your friends. First, you need to enable this functionality later in your own apps. There are specific points in user experience when they're more likely to want to invite others or share content with others. Those are the points that I'm going to expand on and that you need to capitalize on to bring users in. So answering that problem is through referrals, user-driven invites. Referrals are the best type of lead in any business. First, you need to enable your users to be able to refer your app to others. You do that by building invite functionality into your app. This example is from WhatsApp, the app and platform Facebook just bought for an insane $19 billion. So they must be doing something right. You see here, right in the app, they give you a bunch of options for sharing. You can do email, SMS, Twitter, and Facebook. So they have least rep located the App Store share functionality. You don't have to go and find URLs to copy and paste and share with people. This is a much easier flow. But still, this only works so good. This is pretty similar to how the native share functionality works. Here's another example. Snapchat does it well, and I really like when they integrate the friending and following social functions directly with the invites, or directly in the flow that you might look to share with others. So consider when you first launch your app or service and the user base is small. It's negative social proof to display no one on the available contact list. So instead, we want to display all the possibilities. In any social app, when you're creating, publishing, or selecting people, those are the most opportune times to enable invites. Here, you can imagine users scrolling this list and being like, what, AJ's not on Snapchat? Definitely need to get him on here. So boom, I can send in an invite. And he'll know that he has a message waiting for him, which makes him even more likely to join. Quick summary on acquisition, look at all the user interaction opportunities in your software, where users are interacting, collaborating, or sending content and sharing. Use all of those endpoints to include invites and referrals through social media, text message, and email. Another method for getting users back into your app is through backlinks, or making users, senders, and recipients aware of the platform. For example, if I see a whole bunch of my friends sharing to Facebook from Buffer, I'm likely going to go find out what Buffer is and why everyone's using it. At least I'm going to go click that link to see what it is. The second example here is the Twitter app. When you send a tweet via email, it embeds the link by default. Because if you're emailing somebody, you may be doing that because they're not on Twitter for you to at mention them. Anytime you publish content outside of your app or platform, see if you can effectively link it back. That's the perfect opportunity to acquire new users. So next, I'm going to show you a very specific example from Facebook. In iOS, there's two ways you can share to Facebook, and one is through Facebook's own SDK, which you'll see here. The second method is through the native iOS function, which you'll see next. I'm going to tell you that you want to use the Facebook SDK because it will provide a link back to your app. <clears throat> Sharing via iOS only mentions iOS. Again, you'll see more here in a second. Consider this flow here. A user is selected to share something, in this case, a website. The first screen is the native Facebook share dialog that pops up when the user enters a message. Great. The second screen here is what the item looks like when it's posted to my profile. Notice that the link back mentions shared just now via my social app. And then if you click on my social app right here, you'll be taken back to my social app. Or if you click the link in this article, you'll be taken to the third screen here. On this third screen, we've been taken to the shared website, but we additionally get a deep link banner here at the bottom. If I select that open button, that's going to deep link all the way back to my app. Now, this may sound complicated or insignificant, but for Facebook, consider how much traffic is shared and how many additional opportunities you're going to present to link back to your app. Again, these are free links that you don't have to pay Facebook loads of money to promote. So now for the flip side, see this example here, sharing from the native iOS method. I'm sure you've seen this dialog before on the first screen, it's very common. When that's shared, you can see here on the second screen how that looks on my profile. It only mentions shared just now via iOS, so I lose that link back. Lastly, if I drill down to the actual item shared, the website here, we don't have a deep link banner. Again, it might seem small, but it's free. So Facebook link backs are just one example. Remember back to the Twitter email, that's another example, an opportunity to link back to your application. So think of the same interaction points where users and content are interacting outside of your enclosed system. Whenever that happens, you have an opportunity to link back to your system. Those are all the opportunities for user acquisition. 
Two quick examples are sending emails back and forth and sharing content via social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and etc. So next is deep linking. I want to go a little bit more technical on the deep linking part that I mentioned because it's very powerful. So deep linking is almost like an API for apps. In the traditional methods, we use APIs to push and pull information to and from other services. With deep linking, we can invoke similar functionality in other apps. At the very simplest case, think of when you're browsing the internet and you see a phone number. You can click on that phone number and make a phone call. That's the simplest kind of deep linking because you're invoking the phone and passing it a phone number. It's a pretty funny example because our phones are rarely used as phones anymore. Here you can see this flowchart on how deep linking works. You'll invoke a deep link and Facebook will test to see if your app is web or mobile. If it's web, it will send you to the web experience with a link to the mobile experience. If it's mobile, then it'll take you, then it'll attempt to take you, take you to the app store. The powerful part is that if your app is not installed, it will take you to the app store to install it. That's user acquisition. Then if and when it is installed, it can take you back directly into the app and that's engagement. Think of services like Pinterest or Instagram. When you activate one of their items, they'll not only open the app, but they'll drill you down to that specific item you clicked on. On the left here is a brand new service called AppLinks that I wanted to show you guys. So this is brand new in the last year. The example that they give is that, say you're searching for a movie on Rotten Tomatoes, and next you want to go look up tickets and locations of where it's going to be playing. So traditionally with apps, you can't click on a link to do that. You have to leave the app, go to Google or Fandango, and then research all over them. Now that's just bad user experience. So with app links, this is a centralized repository to link app to app. Now just think of how you can integrate this into your enterprise tools. Are there plugins or integrations that your platform supports? There's an opportunity to leverage deep links on the mobile side. Now app links here is a public and open standard that creates an API-like API accessibility with your apps that allows other people to link to your apps and can send you traffic. So we just talked about user acquisition, which is one of the major problems of the App Store. We've all heard of the stereotypical problem that climbing the App Store charts is very hard, getting downloads is hard, discovery is difficult. And then once you've gotten that download, you run into this, user engagement. And the very real problem that most people are going to download your app, open it once, and never return. And then eventually, they're just going to delete it and move on. So when we talk about user engagement, we're assuming we've already gotten that download. So that's victory number one. And now number two is getting that engagement. We're trying to drive users back into our app. We're trying to motivate them to be active. The goal is that engagement drives some activity, which drives traffic and improves our rankings and ratings, then turning in, into a cycle of getting more users and capitalizing it, whether that opportunity is to present an ad or to upsell a SaaS service or convert a sale. Here are some more of our painful statistics. We see very high drop-off rates in the app world. On the left, you can see that within one month, the average app loses 60% of its users. And you can see how that trend continues downward to month two and three. I think it'd be interesting to see what this was on a day-to-day -day level, because most of that drop-off, I bet, is a matter of days. As we saw on the previous slide, the average user downloads an app and uses it once. and then sits there on their phone for a few days, and when they don't have a call to action, they delete it. So how do we combat that? Well, look at the second graph here. It mirrors the first graph, and we see retention plummet after two or three uses. But we do see that there's hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. That if you can make it past 10 uses, retention skyrockets. So that's our threshold value. If a person uses an app 10 times, then they've likely figured it out and they've probably added it to their workflow. So we see engagement soar. So we have a very tangible goal here. If you can reach more than 10 uses, then you've got user engagement. Another interesting metric we see is average app session length, which is about five minutes. Here, we know exactly how much time we have, on average, to capture our users' attention if we're engaging them. Now, if you expect your flow, like sign up or login, to take 15 minutes to complete, then you're going to have a really difficult time. So going back to five minutes, we know that that's the amount of time we have to teach the user how to use the app, keep them interested, interested and get them engaged. If they can't figure it out within five minutes, are not motivated with a call to action, then they're very likely to leave the app. And when they leave the app, especially if it's their first use, they're not likely to return. So now I don't have a slide on filling those five minutes, but talking through it real quickly, think of your user's first time using the app. They're opening the app for the first time, they need to log in or create an account, and that's always a big drop-off point in the funnel. 
What if you can provide a tutorial or video to pique their interest before all of that? Even better, so you can defer registration and drop them right into the app. Show them the value it's going to provide and let them log in later. And then when they do go to log in or create their account for the first time, walk them through the interface. Maybe present a layover explaining the different buttons, show them where the navigation is, or maybe literally walk them through completing their profile or creating their first post. So when we talk about engagement, the first thing we need is attention. Two of the simplest and underutilized methods are with badges and push notifications. I swear there must be a name for the psychological principle that says, if my app has a badge, I'm going to open it just to get rid of that badge. It might be OCD. But as developers, we hope that along the way, we can engage the user to take some action. Of course, we want these to be useful to the user, whether informing them of something, such as like invoices overdue, or prompting them to take action such as complete your profile. Even better is if we can use the additional context on our mobile devices to serve targeted content to the user. Remember, we know when and where they're using our app. So you can see here, RunKeeper is detecting it hasn't been used in a while. And it also remembers the time of day you usually work out. So chances are, you may still have that schedule, but just aren't using the app. This friendly reminder prompts the user to use it. Secondly, back to Foursquare here, we have that location data. We know where our users are and we know where they've been. So we can make suggestions which builds on referrals and the social proof of your friends. That's pretty powerful. And when we make suggestions, a user is more likely to go straight to Foursquare for their information instead of going somewhere like Yelp. Now marketers do this all the time with giant email lists. They'll segment by different variables which may be location, select the interest or past purchases. You can do the same thing here with push notifications. Now push notifications can also carry extra data with them. You're getting an inside scoop on the code here. Look at these push notifications on the right. The first one says TPS report due today. Click here to submit. Management might be expecting a report and hasn't received it yet. So let's prompt the user. The second one is a coupon. Click here for 10% off. You can send targeted push notifications to segmented audiences so you know exactly who's getting exactly what coupon. And then you can perform analytics. The second level here is if we then apply context to this. Remember back to Foursquare, we have extra time and location data now. Maybe the user is nearby a store or some location or event, you can target them with a push notification. So grab your user's attention at the perfect time and provide them with something of value. That's super powerful. The last example just says complete your profile to get connected. That's a useful one too. Maybe the user made it partially through the activation process, but not far enough to really do anything useful or to get any value from your app. Well, prompt them to finish. It's even more powerful to say 25 of your contacts are active right now. Complete your profile to get connected. And when they activate or select that push notification, it can take them directly to that part of the app based on these additional variables, which helps cut down the wasted time and fit more into our five minutes. A bit more on push notifications. We see that if you want to share them with the user, the best times are in the evenings from 7 to 11 p.m. And I think that makes sense because with so many companies doing BYOD, bring your own device, people still have them with them in the evenings when they have extra time and space to play with these new apps, not during the workday. So to recap on push notifications real quick, you have to hold your user's hands. You saw the extra information you can include with the notification. Now it's great if the notification just gets the user to reopen the app. It's even better if it provides them something of value. So a couple simple opportunities are in the cases of events that might be occurring or nearby. Information that you want to share with the user at a specific time or day or location. Content and context. Now just another opportunity that most people overlook is updating your application. It's another badge on the App Store app and the user will open it and see your app again, along with any notes you choose to include. Again, just more face time with your audience. There's a great graphic I wasn't able to dig up, but it associated App Store updates to the number of active user sessions. The example it gave was over a six month period. The company released an update every two weeks or so, and at each release, you saw a significant spike in activity. That's because users see the update and they want to open the app to see what's new. That's re-engagement. Next, we're gonna take a look at Spotify. Now, the free trial has been around forever. Give someone a taste of your software, let them see how it will provide them value, and then once they're engaged, then you can start charging for it. 
Spotify has made their mobile app available to non-premium customers with one catch. You can only play songs in shuffle mode. So you get all of your music, but you can't pick and choose. This gets more users onto the platform and at the very worst, more users hearing their ads. And once they start to value having Spotify on their smartphone, then they'll be much more likely to upgrade to premium. Secondly, the app shows off all the features that basic members are missing out on, and they just show a simple pop-up telling you need to upgrade without being too pushy about it. Then here's LinkedIn. And if you've ever been on their site or app, they make it very clear they have premium versions. Because especially that LinkedIn restricts a lot of mobile from non-premium users, you can easily imagine a business person running between events, trying to look up a colleague, maybe they need to get some information right now, and they have to upgrade to premium to do it. So making that subscription easy is important, and Apple already has all their credit card information. So you can see here they can do it with just a couple taps of the button. All right, so in a one minute summary of user acquisition and engagement, now acquisition is all about visibility and accessibility. How do you get users to discover your platform and how do they access it? You can do that with referrals and user driven invites. We looked at WhatsApp and Snapchat. Fit them into the user interaction process or when a user has a positive experience such as sending a post or adding a friend. Then anytime you have external interactions, maybe you're posting to Facebook or sending an email, be sure to link back to your platform and be sure those links are configured correctly. There's a big difference between using the share with native Facebook and share to Facebook with iOS. Moving to user engagement, we talked about getting your users' attention and increasing the number of touch points. The magic number we want to hit is 10 uses to avoid being deleted. The touch points available to us are through push notifications and badges. Push notifications are the most effective when you include contextual data of where and when the user is using it. We saw examples from RunKeeper and Foursquare. You can load additional tracking codes and variables into your push notifications for extra possibilities. The ones we talked about were unique coupons, tracking codes, or next steps for the app. The best time to engage your users on mobile is between 7 and 11 p.m. Another opportunity for getting FaceTime is to regularly update your app and communicate with users in the update text. Lastly, we looked at Spotify and LinkedIn for a couple examples of apps doing it well. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. My name is Anthony, and I'm from Jackrabbit Mobile. I hope this was useful. I hope you can bring this back to your apps, your companies, and your projects. If you'd like a copy of my slides, you can go to jackrabbitmobile.com slash bizafterwin. And you can contact me at anthony at jackrabbitmobile.com. Thanks.